Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and I'm on a mission to equip you with the information you need to thrive in this data-rich world. You've probably heard something like, correlation doesn't imply causation. That's true, but then what does imply causation? In short, the only way to really make a causal claim is to run a randomized experiment. If you can do that, you can claim causation all day long. If you stick around, I'll teach you what a randomized experiment is, how it can be used to make critically important causal claims, like whether a vaccine is effective at preventing a disease or not, or whether a flashier YouTube thumbnail gets content creators more views. And beyond that, yes, I'll even explain why correlation doesn't imply causation. So here's the game plan. I'm going to first very quickly explain what a correlation is, then explain why we really care about making causal statements, show you what does actually allow you to make all important causal claims, and finally, show you why correlations don't necessarily imply causation. I'll do all this with as little jargon as possible and an emphasis on intuition. So let's start at the very beginning and first understand what a correlation is. In short, a correlation is just a measure of how two pieces of data move together. A correlation can be positive, like in the case of age and wealth. As people get older, they tend to also be wealthier. It's not that every single person who is wealthy is also old, but rather that these two pieces of data have a relationship with one another. If we look across all people, as age goes up, wealth also tends to go up. On the other hand, a correlation can also be negative, like in the case of air temperature and elevation. As we go higher up a mountain, air temperature tends to go down. Again, that's not to say that just being higher up means that I'll be colder, but that does tend to be the case. And finally, a correlation can just be zero, like in the case of the number of times you rub your lucky rabbit's foot and how often you win the lottery. As much as you'd like those two to be related, sadly, they're not. But why do we even care about correlations in the first place? Well, correlations are what allow us to understand the associations and relationships between concepts and ideas in our world. They are one of our simplest statistical tools to help us understand how interconnected our world is. But what they don't tell us is anything about whether one of those concepts and ideas are somehow causally linked to the other. In other words, even though age and wealth are correlated, does that mean age causes wealth? Is all you need to become wealthy is just to get older? I think right away you can see that that's just not true. Sure, as you get older, lots of things happen that contribute to wealth, like having more education, more work experience, and more time to reap the benefits of things like compounded interest. But getting older on its own is not what causes you to get wealthy. And causes are really important for us to understand because they are what let us make good decisions. If you asked me for advice on how to get rich, I wouldn't tell you just to sit back and count your birthdays. That would be terrible advice. In other words, just because age and wealth are somehow related to one another doesn't mean that age is causing wealth. Instead, my advice might focus on mechanisms I think are causally responsible for wealth, like getting a college degree or picking a high earning career. The point is that just because two concepts have an association with one another doesn't mean that one of them causes the other. So how do we make a causal claim then? If merely observing that two ideas are related to one another isn't enough to make a causal claim, then what is? Well, as I said at the start of this video, there's really only one main way to do this, and that's with a randomized experiment. Before we get into why that's true, if you like what you're seeing, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so you don't miss out on any content that I put out. With that said, let's get back to the intuition of causality. To make a causal claim, you need three things to be true. First, you need to observe a relationship of some kind, like a correlation. That's right, even though a correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation, you do need a relationship of some kind to make a causal claim. So if we see that age and wealth are related to one another, that checks our first box. Second, you need what's called time order. Whatever you think is your cause has to actually happen before the outcome. I know that seems stupidly obvious, but it's worth thinking about. If I observe that, say, education and income are correlated, it's possible that education is what causes higher incomes. But it's also possible that as I earn more money, I have more opportunities to go back to school. In other words, to make the claim that education causes income, I have to be sure that education happens first and income follows. If the opposite is possibly true, then I've violated this idea of time order and can't make a causal claim. Finally, and most critically, you have to rule out every single other possible explanation for the observed relationship. Not just some of them, not just most of them, but every single one. We already saw why this is needed in the case of age and wealth. 
Sure, age and wealth are related, and we can be pretty confident that wealth isn't causing age, so time order isn't an issue, but we said that wealth might not be caused by age, but rather by other things like education and work experience. Since we can't be sure that education and work experience aren't responsible for wealth, we can't make the causal claim that age causes wealth, since something else might be the real driver of wealth. Let's ask a different and simpler question to see just why this last point is so critical. Let's say I want to know if standing desks are worth all the hype that they've been getting in terms of how beneficial they are to reducing lower back pain. Personally, I do get some lower back pain when I sit at my desk for a while, but I like to sit when I work, so I don't know what I should do. I want the answer though, so I could do something like this. I could go on Reddit and post something like this. How much lower back pain do you have at the end of the day, and do you use a standing desk or not? I then compare the responses of people who said that they use a standing desk to those who don't and try to draw a conclusion. Right away, let's say I see that the two concepts, lower back pain and standing desks, are absolutely related to one another. In fact, in my made-up scenario, I find that standing desks are associated with 20% less lower back pain. But can I claim that the standing desk is what caused that reduction in back pain? Let's look at the three things we need to be able to make a causal statement. First, is there an association between standing desks and lower back pain? Absolutely, we see that right here. Is there a time order? This one is tricky because it's possible that people who have less lower back pain tend to then get standing desks. But that seems less likely than the case where people first get standing desks and then experience less lower back pain. So we give this up probably okay and move on for now. The hard one though is that last bullet, ruling out all alternative explanations for the association that we see. For instance, maybe people who have standing desks are just younger than those who tend to sit, and that explains why they have lower back pain. Or maybe people who have standing desks work out more, and so their muscle tone is stronger, leading to lower back pain. The point is that we have no idea if the reason that this group of people said that they have less lower back pain is because of the standing desk or because of something else altogether. And because we can't rule out every single possible alternative explanation for this relationship between standing desks and lower back pain, we cannot make a causal claim. Yes, the two concepts are related, but that doesn't mean that they are causally related. It might seem like they are, but we can't say for sure. And if we can't say for sure, then we're just guessing. And I don't want to make decisions like whether I should buy a standing desk or not just based on a guess. So let's do this better. If I really want to know if standing desks help with lower back pain, I need to conduct a randomized experiment. Sometimes this is called an A-B test, sometimes it's called a randomized controlled trial or an RCT. At the end of the day, that's all the same thing. The key is the randomized part. Instead of asking a bunch of people to tell us how their back feels and whether they use a standing desk or not, I need to randomly assign people to either use a standing desk or not and then see how their backs feel. Let's see why this works. Imagine we have people who differ on only two possible dimensions, their age and their physical fitness. In the real world, people obviously differ on a whole lot more than just this, but let's keep this example simple so you get the basic idea. Let's also assume that younger and fitter people have less lower back pain than older and less fit people, which seems like a pretty easy thing to assume. If I then gather up 20 people and ask if they have standing desks, I might find something like this. The problem is that if we want to know if the standing desk is what causes less lower back pain, I might find that the people who tend to have standing desks are also younger and fitter, which we already said is a problem for making causal statements. So instead, what I do is find a group of people who don't have standing desks already, and then randomly assign them to either have a standing desk or not. I can literally flip a coin for each person, and if it comes up heads, they get a standing desk, and if it comes up tails, they don't. By doing this, what I'm ensuring is that people who are younger or fitter are just as likely to receive a standing desk as those who are older and less fit. If I then, after some time, find that the group that was randomly assigned to have a standing desk has less back pain, I can make the causal claim that standing desks reduce lower back pain. It is only after I do this randomization that I can make this claim because randomization is what allows me to rule out every single possible alternative explanation to my causal claim. In my simple example, there are only two ways in which people can differ, but in the real world, there are nearly infinite ways in which they can differ, and still, randomization allows us to rule out every one of those near-infinite differences. That's because my coin flip can come up heads for absolutely any type of person, just as much as it can come up tails. So when I form my two groups, those who have standing desks and those who don't, the only thing that's different is that some of those folks had a coin land on heads, and some had it land on tails. 
And because I determine who has a standing desk based on that coin, that is the only thing that's different about those two groups. This is exactly the technique that is used in what are called double-blind vaccine trials. If I want to know if a vaccine works, I can't just ask for volunteers to get a shot and see if they get sick less than those who don't volunteer, because volunteers are likely wildly different from non-volunteers. Maybe volunteers are just more cautious in general, and so they don't interact with other people as much. Maybe volunteers are younger. Maybe they live in different neighborhoods. There can be so much different that we can't tell if the reason that they don't get infected is because of a vaccine or because of the other million things that are different about them. So instead, we get a lot of volunteers, flip a coin, and give only half of them the vaccine. If those who the coin determines to get the vaccine get infected less, then our vaccine works. And that's entirely because we randomly assign people to get the vaccine or not. By the way, the double blind part is a fantastic way to ensure that our vaccine experiment doesn't have other issues like patient or doctor bias, which is a topic for another video. But in short, if you really are in such a vaccine trial, you get a shot no matter what. The coin decides if the shot is the actual vaccine or just some harmless saline. At the end of the day, half of the volunteers get the vaccine and half don't. What matters is that if this randomized vaccine experiment shows that the half of people who actually got the vaccine were less infected with whatever disease it was designed to prevent, then we can make the causal claim that the vaccine works. And critically, this is the only case where we can do so because we meet all three conditions for causal claims. There's an association between vaccination and disease infection, the vaccination happened before we tested for infection rates, and critically, because of the randomization, we can rule out every single other possible explanation for the relationship between vaccination and reduced infection rates. We can use the exact same technique to test other, maybe less important causal claims, like effectiveness of different YouTube thumbnails, by randomly assigning some viewers to see one type of thumbnail and others to see another. Or whether raising prices on a product on Amazon causes a decrease in sales. Or whether people are more likely to be more productive working from home or working at the office. As long as you randomly assign people to different groups and then measure some meaningful outcome, you can make causal claims. Anything short of that, and you're stuck in the world where correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. To be fair, I glossed over a few topics like ensuring that the sample size of your experiment is large enough, how to validly measure outcomes, and how to make pseudo-causal claims, ones that aren't as solid as the ones we talked about here, but maybe enough to help inform some big decisions. If these topics are ones you find interesting and want to learn more about, take a moment to comment below and I'll make sure to create content meant just for you, my viewers. Finally, if you found this video interesting, please take a moment to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click that little bell icon so you don't miss out on any new content I put out. Thanks for watching.